and welcome to the Justice Committee. The first item is the decision on taking business in private, um, consideration of draft stage one report of the civil litigation on bill um, both today and at future meetings should be taken in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. 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 Mary's apologies and Claire's attendance. Yeah. Um, we have uh, apologies from Mary Fee and I welcome to the committee Claire Baker as her substitute. Um, we've received an indication that the Minister is going to be a little late, so given the heavy um, agenda, we intend to move to agenda item for the subordinate legislation. Are we agreed to do that? Yes. Agreed, okay. Um, agenda item four is consideration of three negative instruments. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk. The first instrument is Police Pension Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 217 oblique 387. Do members have any comments? John. 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 Can I make a declaration, please? Although this will not apply to me, I am in receipt of a police pension. And I should Duly noted. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other comments? Right. Uh, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Yes. Thank you. The second instrument is Prisons and Young Offenders Institutions Scotland Amendment Rules 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 393. Do members have any comments? Clear? Um, thank you, convener. I was hoping to um, get some clarity around uh, this. Uh, I, mean, I do think it's a challenging um, ambition to have smoke-free prisons by November um, 2018, but it was around the policy objective, it was around the definition of smoke, which was to include nicotine vapour products. It was some clarity around whether um, that meant that the nicotine vapour products would apply the same rules around the 30-minute clearing of the, the cell before an officer enters, or if that applied to the target for um, November 18 if the vapour products came under that target. Mm -hmm. Would you be satisfied sure. um, to, to get maybe more information, more clarity from it, but would, in principle to um, approve the recommendation? Um, that would be helpful, yes. Yeah, some clarity around that point would be helpful. Okay, Thank you. Mm, clerks can certainly seek that from the Minister. So, any other comments? If there aren't any, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Are we all agreed? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. The third instrument um, is First Tier Tribunal for, for Scotland Health and Education Chamber and General Regulatory Chamber Charity Appeals Procedure Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2017. 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 398. Do members have any comments? Um, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Right, agreed. okay that. Um, agenda item number five, we may as well move on to. It's feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of the 23rd of November 2017, which in the absence of Mary Fee, I will read. Um, this will be a verbal report and there'll be opportunity for brief comments um, and questions. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. And if I can find the, it's here somewhere, the note. <laughs> Right, got it here. Thanks. Right, um, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 23rd of November 2017 when it held an evidence session on the progress of the two independent investigations into Police Scotland's Counter Corruption Unit. The subcommittee took evidence from Police uh, Scotland, the Scottish Police Authority, the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents and Unison. The subcommittee heard about the restructuring of Police Scotland's Professional Standards Department and how Police Scotland handles complaints against its officers. The subcommittee also asked questions about the current status um, of the investigation into the CCU and about the publication status of the forthcoming reports of these investigations. The subcommittee will next meet on 7th of December 2017 when it will hold an evidence session on Police Scotland's custody provisions. Are there any comments or questions following this? John Finney? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, this, as you know, is 
dragged on for a considerable length of time and, and it looks like it's going to continue to drag on. I don't think that's in anyone's interest. Indeed, there are three investigations ongoing, Durham Constabulary, Northumberland Police and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And what we did learn, of course, was that there was an additional report um, from one of the English forces covering chief officers that, uh, well, hitherto I certainly wasn't aware of. So I would encourage Police Scotland to turn this issue around as quick as possible to remove much of the unhelpful speculation there is about uh, the work in this field. Okay. Any other comments following that subcommittee report? Um, there has been a brief discussion this morning and maybe looking at the possibility of the Justice Committee in the new year having the new chair of SPA in and the interim chief constable for full, if a full-time appointment hasn't been made. So there would be an opportunity for the full Justice Committee to... Um, to uh, have an opportunity to ask questions and, um, and to meet both of these, these people. Right, um, we really can't move much further on, so I intend to suspend until the Minister arrives. Um, agenda item two, subordinate legislation, um, is consideration of five affirmative instruments. The first is first tier tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions and additional support needs tribunals for Scotland regulations 2018 draft. Second is first tier tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions of the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel regulations 2018 draft. Third is the first tribunal for Scotland Health and Education Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018 Draft. The fourth is First Tier Tribunal for Scotland General Regulatory Chamber Charity Appeals Cases and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018 Draft. And the fifth and last, the Public Records Scotland 2011 Authorities Amendment Order 2018 Draft. And I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, to the committee together with her officials, Hannah Frodstrom, Policy Executive and John St. Clair, Senior Principal Legal Officer with the Scottish Government. Um, this item is to transfer the to, uh, members to put to the Minister and officials any points that they're seeking clarification on <coughs> the instrument before we formally dispose of it. And I refer members to Paper 1, which is a note by the Clerk. And Minister, do you wish to make a short opening statement? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I'll, I'll deal firstly with the, four, the first four. Uh, uh, SSIs and then uh, secondly with the public records uh, Scotland SSI if that's okay in each um, if you could do it briefly in um, each order then it allows us to ask the question and not get yes, too I, mixed I up. Yes I believe that the speaking notes are in mentioning each separate SSI okay, in order that's, that's okay yeah. so um, firstly the, this suite of uh, fairly technical regulations will transfer the additional support needs tribunal for Scotland and the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel into the Scottish Tribunal structure created by the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014 um, the first two instruments before you are the first tier tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions of the additional support needs tribunals for Scotland regulations 2018 and the first tier tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions of the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel regulations 2018 these regulations simply transfer the functions and members of the Additional Support Needs Tribunals for Scotland and the Scottish Charity Appeals uh, Panel to the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland. In addition, 
the regulation set out the transitional procedure for cases that are in progress on the date of transfer. The regulations also make consequential amendments to primary and secondary legislation resulting from the transfer of the additional supports needs tribunals for Scotland and the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel into the Scottish Tribunals. As the additional support needs tribunal for Scotland and the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel are listed separately in the Tribunals Act, each of the jurisdictions needs to be dealt with in separate instruments. The next set of regulations are the First Year Tribunal for Scotland Health and Education Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018. These regulations specify the type of member who will hear cases in the Health and Education Chamber. These provisions mirror the existing composition of the Additional Supports Needs Tribunals for Scotland. These regulations also allow the Chamber President or a legal, me legal member sitting alone to hear any matter in a case under section 18, subsection 3, subsection EA or subsection EB of the Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act 2004. These sections are due to be commenced on 10 January 2018 and allow the Tribunal to decide whether a child over the age of 12 has capacity to exercise their rights under the 2004 Act on their own behalf. The instrument also sets out the composition of the upper tribunal when hearing appeals from the first tier health and education chamber. These regulations allow for a court of session judge to hear an appeal in the upper tribunal. This again mirrors the previous arrangements. The president of tribunals will determine who hears these appeals. The president may also select herself, the chamber president or indeed the lord president if appropriate. The final set of regulations in this first suite of four is the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland General Regulatory Chamber Charity Appeals Cases and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018. These regulations specify the type of member who will hear charity appeals cases in the First Tier Tribunal. These provisions again mirror the existing composition of the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel. The instrument also sets out the composition of the Upper Tribunal when hearing charity appeals from the General Regulatory Chamber. The regulations allow for a court of session judge to hear an appeal in the upper tribunal, and this again mirrors the previous arrangements. The president of tribunals will determine who hears these appeals. The president may also select herself, the chamber president, or uh, indeed the lord president if appropriate. In conclusion, on these four SSIs, it is the case that each of these instruments plays a part in enabling the transfer of the additional support needs tribunals for Scotland and the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel to the new structure. Uh, finally, the last SSI is the uh, uh, order amending the Public Records Scotland Act 2011. This very technical instrument adds the first tier tribunal and upper tribunal to the list of authorities covered by the Public Records Scotland Act 2011. Uh, this Act requires listed authorities to prepare and to submit a records management plan to the Keeper of the Records of Scotland for his agreement. The Act also requires the authorities to implement their agreed plans, comply with the arrangements they set out and keep them under review. Currently, a number of the tribunals are listed separately in the Public Records Scotland Act. However, as these tribunals transfer into the Scottish Tribunal structure, their listing is deleted because the tribunal is abolished upon transfer. This instrument therefore rectifies this by adding both the first tier tribunal and upper tribunal to the list of authorities. Uh, and that is the conclusion of my opening remarks. I'm sorry it was a bit long convener, but I felt given the Tune. technicalities involved, it was important to set out right, uh, the yes. position. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, the, for that detail. Uh, do members have any questions or comments? That being the case, then we'll move to agenda item number three, which is formal consideration of the motions in relation to the affirmative instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on these instruments and has no comments on them. The motions will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate if that's necessary. The first motion is motion 08839, that the Justice Committee recommends that the first tier tribunals for Scotland transfer of functions of the additional support needs tribunals for Scotland regulations 2018 draft be approved. Minister, uh, will you move the motion? Formally moved. Yeah, thank you. Do members have any questions? In that case, I put the question, is that motion 08839 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved? Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Thank you.
The second motion is motion 08840 that the Justice Committee recommends that the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions of the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Minister, will you move the motion? <coughs> moved. Thank you. <coughs> Do members have any questions or comments? No. That being the case, then the question is that motion 08840 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The third motion is that motion 08841, that the Justice Committee recommends that the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland Health and Education Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Will you move the motion, Minister? Formally moved. Thank you. Um, do members have any comments, questions? No. The question is that the motion 08841 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, motion number four is um, 09234 that the Justice Committee recommends that the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland General, General Regulatory Chamber charity appeal, appeals cases and the Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Will you move the motion, please, Formally Minister? Moved. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from members? No. The question is that motion 09234 in the name of Anu, Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. The fifth and final motion is motion 08843 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Public Records Scotland Act 2011 Authorities Amendment Order 2018 draft be approved. Will you move the motion, Minister? Formally moved. Thank you. Do members have any questions or comments? No. Um, the question is that motion 08843 in the name of Annabel Young <coughs> be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I'll commit, are members content to delegate authority to me as the convener to clear the final draft report? Yes. Thank you. And um, can I thank the Minister and her officials for attending and suspend briefly for a change of officials before our next item?
Agenda item 6 is our fifth evidence session of the Offensive Behaviour, Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper 4, which is a note by the clerk, and paper 5, which is a private paper. And again, welcome James Kelly, the member in charge of the bill, to the meeting. Um, I also welcome back uh, Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal <coughs> Affairs, and her officials, David Bell, Senior Policy Officer, Catherine Mayant, uh, Principal Research Officer and Craig French Lister, Director of Legal Services um, with the Scottish Government. Do you wish to make a short opening statement, Minister? Yes, thank you, I can be there, uh, and thank you for inviting me to, to give evidence to the committee today. The Scottish Government believes that the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act should not be repealed without putting a viable alternative in place. The Act did not appear in a vacuum. As far back as 2008, there were complaints raised by the Irish Consulate and the Catholic Church about the singing of the famine song at matches, deemed to be racist by our courts. In 2011, we witnessed multiple arrests at a Scottish Cup match, pitch side aggression between the former Rangers and Celtic managers Ali McCoist and Neil Lennon, death threats being made to Mr Lennon, and live bullets being sent through the post to a range of public figures. These incidents could not be ignored and swift action was required to make it clear that such behaviour would not be tolerated. A strong signal was needed and that took the form of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. This was not without precedent. The Emergency Workers Scotland Act 2005 is an example of legislation used to send a strong signal that particular behaviours are not acceptable. The Act responded to the circumstances that existed at the time, and as we have seen in the latest death threat to Neil Lennon, which resulted in a 54-year-old man being convicted under Section 6 of the Act, we are not rid of these problems. But there is more to the Act than making a statement. The Act provides extraterritorial powers to ensure those behaving in an abusive manner outside Scotland can be held to account. And Section 6 brings Scotland into line with the rest of the UK in relation to incitement uh, to religious hatred. I am grateful to the committee for drawing the recent submission by the Scottish Human Rights Commission to my attention and remain happy that the Act is also compatible with human rights. The Commission's submission appears to be a statement of their 2011 position, which does not take account of developments such as the Donnelly and Walsh uh, case of 2015, which did not identify any human rights issues. We remain happy to improve the Act based on evidence. Indeed, although entirely separate from the repeal bill, the reason for inviting Lord Brackadale to conduct a review of hate crime legislation was to identify how all existing legislation in this area could be improved. There are three principles that underpin our position in relation to the Act. The first is acceptance that there is a problem with behaviour at and associated with Scottish football. Offensive singing and chanting is not a feature of any other sporting events. The vast majority of football fans are well behaved, but the fact that we do continue to regularly hear offensive singing and chanting clearly tells us that there is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Football is not an island on its own where people are free to do as they choose without any need to consider the wider impact of their behaviours. Aggressive behaviour deemed acceptable at football will simply be carried into other areas of life. The second principle is that action and interventions are required to tackle all social problems. Offensive behaviour at football will not simply disappear on its own. Football clubs and authorities have had decades to tackle this issue and failed to take effective action to bring it under control. And the third principle is that legislation is needed, but it is not a panacea in and of itself. Convener, legislation sets the standards for what is and is not acceptable in society, and it has an important role to play in tackling offensive behaviour at football. Outright appeal, a repeal is not favoured by those representing vulnerable minority communities, and it is not favoured by the Scottish Government. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if, if I could ask for your thoughts, Minister, on why so many people um, uh, feel that the 2012 Act should be repealed. Uh, well, I, I can't put my head easily inside of, of those who, who seek uh, repeal. I think it would be important to, to state at the same time, though, that many people do not uh, support repeal or do not support repeal absent a viable alternative uh, being put in place or who feel uh, the repeal without such a viable alternative would uh, risk sending entirely the wrong message in terms of the possible uh, uh, consequence that people could think that 
uh, this uh, offensive uh, behaviour was in fact uh, acceptable. So it's difficult for me to put myself in the, the heads and minds of those who seek repeal, but I think it is fair to say that obviously, uh, and you'll be well aware, the committee has received uh, a range of evidence uh, and with uh, very differing views on that particular issue. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask you specifically about the, the, the guidance and the regulations that the SPFL and SFA have put in place, a very detailed one, which seem to, to really in minute detail go down to the behaviour with sanctions, um, checks and balances, um, because in your opening statement you mentioned that you, the authorities didn't seem to have tackled the problem. Was well, that still the case? Well, the, the, I think it's correct to say that it has taken quite a long time to get this arrangement in place, but now the, there is an arrangement in place looking at uh, unacceptable conduct, and I believe data has been gathered uh, over this first season of its full application, and obviously we await to see with interest what the data uh, tells us, and uh, obviously are very keen to continue. Uh, uh, to work with uh, the football uh, authorities and indeed football clubs to ensure that we eradicate this uh, uh, bile and bigotry uh, from uh, football in Scotland. Uh -huh. So would there be acknowledgement that before, you know, in, as you know, in your opening statement, you, you said the, the authorities didn't <coughs> seem to have tackled that, that we've moved a considerable way um, in terms of their involvement addressing the, the issue? Well, I think it's fair to say that this arrangement is really quite new. I think this is the first season of its full application, so I think it's fair to say that it has been quite some time coming, but nonetheless it is welcome in that regard. And, of course, we wait to see the data has been collected over this first season of its full application. We await to see what that data uh, tells us to see uh, if uh, indeed more needs to be done. Uh, but we, uh, as I say, are very happy to continue to work with football authorities and indeed football clubs to ensure that we all work together uh, to eradicate this uh, unacceptable behaviour uh, from Scottish football. Uh, George Addo. Uh, I was quite interested in how you, when your opening remarks here, when you mentioned the fact that this didn't happen in a vacuum. You know, there is an urban myth that uh, it was basically happened uh, when the two managers went toe-to-toe -to -toe in the so-called uh, game of shame. Uh, but there was, as you quite rightly said, the bullets through the post, a Celtic manager having sectarian slogans uh, and scrawled outside his home. Uh, the, the famine song was sung on a regular occasion, so much so that, as you said, the Irish consulate complained about it, and songs that were supportive on both sides of acts of terrorism. Now, with all that in mind, what do you believe the introduction of the legislation was a proportional response to what was happening? Uh, yes, I do. I, I think um, the, the, the match that the member refers to, I think it's called the, the shame game. Game um, of shame. The game of shame or the shame game, uh, for short. Um, I think that certainly was the tip of the iceberg, but I don't think that in and of itself was the, the catalyst. I think it was this uh, uh, catalogue of very, very serious... Uh, 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 incidents in and around football and of course decades of, of seeing uh, this kind of problem at football in terms of the, 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 the religious, the homophobic slurs, the bio, the bigotry, sexist comments uh, and sectarianism, this hateful and prejudicial behaviour. So I, I think um, there were a number of factors but certainly in terms of when the original legislation uh, was uh, put forward. There was a, a backdrop of very, very serious uh, events indeed, and I think it was felt appropriate that this Parliament, the National Parliament of Scotland, should be seeking to respond to those very, very serious events uh, in a reasonable and proportionate manner, and, and that was the, what culminated in the legislation which was adopted by this Parliament. It's interesting you brought up the part, the, the fact that you said there's homophobia, because this is one of part of the that was quite interesting during the evidence we received from uh, Colin McFarlane from Stonewall Scotland, because he said repealing the Act without putting other measures in could undermine the work that had been undertaken by organisations such as Stonewall, the Equality Network and Football Clubs and Police Scotland. And is it not the case that, you know, that what type of message would this send out to these clubs if we went for repeal? Does this not give some fans, some of the fans that, who actually did uh, get involved in all this nonsense, they actually would uh, think that this is some kind of victory in their part? They could then behave as they wished from that point on? I think I've uh, read what uh, Stonewall Scotland and the Equality Network indeed, uh, in terms of the comments submitted to the committee, uh, and I do understand that they have very... Uh, serious concerns that there is a significant risk uh, 
that repeal of this legislation without any viable alternative being in place would send entirely the wrong message that somehow this prejudicial and hateful behaviour was somehow to be condoned uh, and all that might come from that. So I very much understand uh, their concerns in that regard. And I, I think they, they refer to surveys that had been carried out uh, and where it shows that actually uh, amongst, for example, the LGBTI community, there are very serious concerns about what happens at football. And uh, they, they, they consistently uh, said in response to questionnaires that they have, um, they have fears about uh, uh, football and, and the, the, the level of diatribe, homophobic diatribe directed uh, at uh, uh, who are citizens of Scotland like everybody else. So uh, I, I think that, yes, I, I do understand the very serious uh, concerns that the uh, repeal, absent a viable alternative, uh, risks very significant uh, signals being sent that somehow this behaviour is in fact to be condoned and that society is quite happy to, to see this continue. One, one final very short question uh, is the fact that we received evidence, I can't even remember the individual's name, but it was quite interesting uh, if you look at it that way, where he effectively told us that, and an academic told us that he believed that it was your right to be offensive at football. You know, you could, it would take all the passion out of the game if you weren't offensive at football. Surely in the 21st century, Minister, that can't possibly be the way that we conduct ourselves in a public place. Well, I, I would sincerely hope not. That's not the kind of Scotland that most people, I think, want to, 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 to live in. Of course, freedom of speech is an absolute a fundamental right, but it's not an absolute right. There's freedom also to be uh, not subjected to hateful and prejudicial uh, 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 behaviour. And I think it was uh, Dr Duncan Morrow's advisory committee on tackling sectarianism that uh, made the point that uh, football seems to provide a permissive environment where people feel that they can behave in a way some people with them might have, <laughs> very much the minority of people, has to be said, but nonetheless feel they can behave in a way that they wouldn't really contemplate necessarily behaving in any other part of their life. Uh, and it's this permissive nature of the, the environment of football, uh, I, I think, that we have to, to uh, reflect on. But uh, I, I, uh, for my part, from the part of the Scottish Government, it's absolutely not acceptable. Hate crime in whatever form, hateful and prejudicial behaviour is not acceptable. Uh, and people have to, uh, in exercise of their freedom of expression, recognise the rights of others who they live side by side with in society. Thank you. Perhaps asking, Minister, in the event that, say, for example, the Act is repealed, what steps would the, the Scottish Government take to ensure there is clarity for supporters and the general public as to what will be criminal in the, the football context? Well, uh, obviously, if, if that were the, the will of Parliament, that the Act were to be repealed, absent any viable alternative, we would nonetheless, of course, as a responsible government, continue to work with football, uh, the football authorities, continue to work with football clubs. We would continue to try to seek to send strong messages. We'd work with stakeholders that we already work with uh, at a grass, grassroots level. Uh, in, in an effort to try to meet the uh, significant concerns that have been raised by uh, various organisations, not just the quality organisations, that uh, indeed there could be a, a very negative message sent in circumstances of repeal without a viable alternative. But we as a responsible government would continue to do what we could. Obviously, in terms of the uh, criminal law, I think it was the representative from the Crown Office in his oral evidence who indicated that they would be looking at then coming up with guidelines about breach of the peace in Section 38 of the Criminal Justice Scotland and Licensing Act 2010. I, I, I imagine we're going to get on to how that yeah. sits with the Act. Absolutely. I won't do it just now, but um, you know th 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 that would be something that could be done. But whether that would address the real and significant concerns of those who have expressed those concerns, that somehow this would send a really very bad message indeed uh, is another matter, but we as a responsible government would of course continue to, to do what we can. A supplementary, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask something that we've not really touched on before in relation to this. If the Act is to be repealed um, and there's to be a broad public ca messaging campaign, what, um, is there any thought, have the government had any thoughts how much that might cost, given the, um, given the difficulties facing the public sector just now? Uh, across the board, which, is, which has been widely discussed. What uh, financial implications might there be of such a, a campaign? 
if the act is to be repealed? Well, I, I don't think that's noble as of this moment in time. Uh, I think there would be a number of strands that would have to be reflected upon and, and fleshed out in detail, and only at that stage could you start to uh, attach a, a budgetary implication for each of those strands. But it, well, it's, it's a fair point, something to bear in mind. I don't think it's possible today to, to give any uh, figure because we don't have enough knowledge about each of the elements that would require to be reflected upon to arrive at a, a, a comprehensive, um, accurate uh, figure. I think the, the point I, I, was, I was making is in relation to the amount of evidence that we've heard, um, the, the, the concerns around repeal of the Act would lead to a, a signal and a message being sent out. So uh, it was just to sort of put out there that there might be um, financial implications to addressing that message, <coughs> um, if that is something that people were still saying to us at that point. Just just point, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Claire, did, did you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to pick up on in the Minister's opening statements. Um, the Minister said that she can't put her head into those who want to repeal the Act, which I find disappointing that the government's not able to articulate or recognise the concerns that are around the Act. I can accept that the government might not agree with them, but I think it's important the government does recognise the arguments that are coming forward that, um, that are asking for repeal of the Act. Um, also, the Minister said that we hear offensive chanting, which I assume means we continue to hear offensive chanting, which suggests the bill hasn't been as effective as what the government would want it to be, if that's the area it's trying to tackle. And the third point was, um, well, there was nothing I disagreed with in terms of the Minister's comments around what is acceptable behaviour at football. And I recognise the comments that have been from Stonewall and the concerns that they have. Um, my understanding of convictions that have been under legislation, though I'm happy to be corrected, have been concentrated around sectarianism and not so much around homophobic abuse. I don't know if there's any cases where that has been the key element being brought forward in a charge and that would strengthen the argument that there is sufficient and other legislation in place to deal with these type of um, hate crimes. Okay. Um so, in terms of the first point that the member raised, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, other people are not entitled to, to have their views and, and in the regard that the member referred to, to have concerns. That's their entitlement, that's the view that they have. I just don't share their views and therefore I find it difficult for... I mean, I imagine we're going to get on to a lot of the detail about, you know, the Act versus what the existing law was, for example. Uh, having read through all the written submissions, uh, claims that somehow... Uh, the Act is criminalising a whole swathe of the fan body when we see actually the number of charges is not reflective at all of that statement, uh, where we see the suggestion that the Act is uh, going after specific football clubs or fans and it's not, the evidence has been given to, to show that that's not the case. I think, indeed, Police Scotland indicated that of the 42 professional clubs in Scotland, 24 clubs have had... In, in instances where their fans have been involved, so that suggests that not one particular fa football club is the subject of some vindictive victimisation. So I do note all the, 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 the points that have been made. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I, I, I guess that we will get on to some of the more detailed issues in due course. Um, uh, in terms of the, the effect of the Act, um, I think, as I said in my opening remarks, that legislation is one element. There are many other strands of the work that the Scottish Government is doing uh, uh, in terms of hate crime in general, uh, but the, the legislation to set uh, normative um, standards uh, uh, is quite an accepted way to proceed. Uh, and in terms of the effectiveness, it is, uh, I think, has been uh, stated by uh, the Crown Office in particular uh, in the evidence session here, it provides uh, a tool uh, that the Crown Office can use. And there have been, I think, in 1617, some 377 charges. So that's an increase of 32% over the previous year which suggests that there are still, and it is the absolute minority, tiny minority of fans who engage in this behaviour, but nonetheless it can be very serious uh, behaviour, seriously uh, offensive, threatening, abusive behaviour uh, that uh, surely as a society we accept that we, we are going to say that that is not acceptable. On the, the last point about the instances of cases where there may have been a charge libelled as regards homophobic abuse, I'm afraid I don't have that stat, but... I don't know if the... We are on the 
call the okay. questions go through um, <laughs> so we can perhaps that will that would, the crown office would have that and perhaps the clerk would like to to get that i just don't have that stat off the top of my head okay. thank you, thank you. Uh, Mary Gershon. You know, uh, there has been some cri criticism levied at the, uh, we've had people say about the, the perceived speed at which the, the Act in 2012 was passed, and uh, criticism that they feel that the, the, the legislation was rushed and as a result of that, perhaps not drafted as tightly uh, as it might have been. And I would just ask for your response to, the, to those comments. Um, well, uh, obviously, the, the, the circumstances of the introduction legislation I narrated in my opening uh, statement. The Act, I think, uh, was passed in a period of six months. It went through all its normal stages. Uh, 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 indeed, at stage one, I believe that uh, I was there at the time. Um, there were 103 votes in favour of the bill proceeding at stage one and uh, five, uh, five against and 15 abstentions. So it did pass its stage one procedure. It went through its, its normal uh, legislative scrutiny thereafter. Um, obviously, uh, that's a six-month period. I think in terms of the original time scale for Mr Kelly's bill, you were perhaps looking at an eight-month period. So it's not, uh, not so different uh, 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 in terms of the, the original act. Um, uh, in terms of whether things can be improved, my experience in life is most always things can be improved upon and I've always said that my door is open if people wish to come forward with uh, uh, constructive uh, suggestions, evidence-based as to how we, we can collectively work to improve the legislation and my door remains open in that regard. Uh, that leads nicely into my next question actually because that was going to be the exact thing I was going to ask was about have you had, I know you say that your door is open, have you had any contact from anyone with these, with evidence-based uh, changes or any proposals as to how the the legislation could be improved? Uh, I've not received any uh, specific proposals uh, as government minister uh, uh, to, to suggest making such improvements or amendments to the Act. Okay, thank you. Um, we heard in our last evidence session where we had a panel of academics uh, from Andrew Tickell who had said that uh, rather than repealing the Act, it, it needed uh, amending, and he gave some proposals, uh, uh, which I imagine you'll you'll have seen and seen the evidence from the committee we took that day. I mean, how would you re respond to some of the the suggestions and ideas that he put forward at that session? Well, I, I read uh, Andrew Tickell's uh, uh, written submission with interest, uh, and uh, what I would say is that we are perfectly happy to to reflect on that. Uh, uh, on those uh, suggestions, uh, uh, and that's what we will be quite happy to do. Obviously, their suggestions based on the Act not being repealed. Uh, so if, if the Act were to be repealed, they're not suggestions that could be brought forward as improvements to, to the Act. But we're perfectly, perfectly happy to c c consider and reflect upon Andrew Tickell's uh, suggestions. OK, thank you. And just one final question. I, I think some of the concerns that we'd heard have been, well, what will happen if the Act is repealed? What's left in its place? And what kind of behaviour are we seeing to the public is therefore acceptable? And I read a concern, I think it was a headline that was in the news last week, that football-related hate crimes have gone up by a third on railways. And I do, I do think that, I mean, how do we tackle that then if the Act is to be re repealed? Um, and I just feel like it does send out completely the wrong message, that we, especially if we're seeing that sort of crime increase about the message that would send out if we went forward and repealed the, repealed the Act. Yeah, I mean, I, I, fear, uh, I fear very seriously that uh, repealing the Act without a viable alternative would send entirely the wrong signal. Uh, and I note, as I've said, that uh, there's a number of organisations that have made that point in terms of uh, that they have concerns that there would be a risk that that would happen. I, I feel that it, it may be uh, more likely than not, but certainly I accept, as do many organisations like Stonewall, Equality Network, uh, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, the Church of Scotland, uh, I think Victim Support Scotland and others, I think um, the, there is a concern that this, uh, at this time, when we have seen incidences in different areas of hate crime increasing, uh, and particularly online <laughs> hate uh, crime uh, as well, uh, I think that this would send entirely the wrong signal. And as I say, and I've said in my response to the members' uh, initial questions, the Scottish Government remains happy to work to improve the Act, uh, to, to listen to those who have uh, specific views about how that could be done on a constructive basis, evidence-based, and we uh, would be happy to reflect on that. Um, I mean, the, the member uh, talked uh, a moment ago about um, hate crime instances having increased by a third on, 
our railways. I mean, it was just struck when I was reading one of the written submissions, the Scottish Women's Convention, I think it was, where they uh, said that actually uh, women are afraid to go into the, to the city of Glasgow uh, if there's a big match on. I think that just sums it up in one sentence. OK, thank you. Morris? Thank you, um, Good morning, Minister. Uh, um, have you, has the government considered whether the actual act itself could be improved by amendment? And if so, what changes do you foresee these taking in regard to the Section 1 offence? Uh, well, uh, as I say, our, our door is open to, to constructive suggestions. Uh, thus far, I, 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 I as Minister personally have not, uh, nobody's been exactly queuing outside my door uh, to, to make those suggestions, but my door remains open to that. A moment ago, we were discussing Andrew Tekel's uh, interesting mm -hmm. suggestions, and I've said that we would be happy uh, to look at that in, in more detail, uh, uh, if that's helpful to the member. Can I follow on? Um, but therefore, in fact, you as a government, uh, your government hasn't actually come up with any amendments itself. Forget what else other people bring in. You haven't seen any need to change it. Uh, well, uh, or we... Or amend it, sorry. Correct <laughs> We feel that, on balance, uh, the issue of the, the Section 1 versus the existing law, that uh, that has allowed uh, additional tools to be uh, at the disposal of those seeking to enforce uh, the law of the land. Um, uh, and therefore, a lot of the submissions have focused on that issue, and I don't really share the, the view that... Uh, if you were to repeal without any viable alternative that the existing legislation would uh, not involve limitations on what uh, could be done because I think it would involve limitations on what uh, could be done. So uh, in that regard, uh, I, I'm not convinced uh, uh, completely that uh, an amendment in that regard would be the way to go. However, as I say, I did note with interest Mr Tickell's uh, suggestions and as I say, we'd be happy to reflect on this further. Thank you. That point, could I just um, just absolutely know if you think Section One, as currently drafted, is fit for for purpose? Uh, yes, I think it is. It is fit for purpose. I think that has been demonstrated uh, uh, in the courts. Um, uh, could things be improved upon? You know, as I've said, uh, most things in life can benefit from improvement. So <laughs> we are happy to consider what improvements, substantive improvements constructively suggested and evidence-based could be made uh, and that is the, the commitment that I have been happy to reaffirm uh, today. Okay. Maurice Corrie. Yes, thank you. Could, you, could I further ask, Minister, um, the term um, uh, that I see, uh, other behaviour, and I quote, other behaviour that a reasonable person would be likely to consider offensive should have been defined on the face of the legislation to provide clarity. Does the Minister uh, accept that this provision as currently drafted is too broad? And if, if the Act was to be amended rather than be repealed, would such a definition, definition be required? Um, follows on. The, the, the reasonable person test actually is, uh, is a common feature of the, of the law. Uh, and, um, for example, uh, I know that much has been made of uh, breach of peace and Section 38 of the 2010 Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act. But that involves a reasonable person uh, approach as well. This is quite common. Um, the, the danger of, of absolutely defining something you know, to, to the nth degree is that you, you leave something out, and that is always a balance when you're drafting legislation. For example, I think the example was given of dangerous driving, where that is not uh, subject to an exhaustive list of, 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 of uh, circumstances which would meet the test of dangerous driving, but uh, there are facts and circumstances to be adduced in that uh, uh, consideration. Also, of course, the, the test of the, the reasonable person has to sit alongside the other part of the test, which is uh, looking at likely to incite public disorder. So there are two strands to this test, not just uh, one. And of course, the Lord Advocate's uh, updated um, guidelines in August uh, 2015 uh, are helpful in fleshing out exactly what is uh, is. Uh, uh, it likely to be uh, included in this and uh, I think you've had a, a, a look around the guide in, guidelines in previous evidence sessions. I'm happy to, to refer to them, uh, they're quite lengthy, but uh, the Lord Advocate's guidelines do uh, in fact cover many of these uh, issues. So you don't, sorry, Minister, uh, Chair, can I just follow on? Yeah, um, Minister, so therefore you don't believe that it's putting a too big a net out to catch all sorts of fish, shall we say, that might come into that? Um, and the, therefore it's too broad a brush approach and not taking a scalpel to actually identify the critical problem. Uh, 
Well, the, the reasonable person test, but I think that was the, 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 the concern that the member had around the, this issue. The, the reasonable person test is quite a common test in law uh, and indeed is in the 2010 Criminal Justice uh, and Licensing Scotland Act. Uh, so it's a, it's a common concept. It's one that, uh, that uh, the law has dealt with uh, quite comfortably over many years uh, and, as I say, fleshed out by the fact that there are the Lord Advocate guidelines of 2015 and also to bear in mind that there's another element to this test, which is that it also must be a uh, behaviour that is likely to, to cause public disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And we do have the guidelines of the Minister. So, so you don't want me to read them out? Okay. <coughs> no, <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. Uh, ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, Minister. Just uh, briefly on, uh, to, to follow on from the, the previous questions, there's been some discussion this morning about amendment, uh, potential amendment of the, the current Act. Uh, and you said in your opening statement that you'd be happy to improve the Act based on evidence. Uh, is the, the position of the government similar to those of many witnesses that we've uh, heard from in recent weeks, from the Church of Scotland Society Council to Andrew Tickell and others, that there's a strong uh, argument and a strong consensus to wait until the uh, review being undertaken by Lord Brackadale is complete in order to consider what positions he, he has taken uh, at the end of that review before considering amendment of the current act and of course that is predicated on uh, repeal not taking place. Okay, um, obviously the Lord Brackadale review is independent of, of government and I like everybody else await his recommendations which I think are expected at the present time in spring 2018. Um, I, I don't know what those will be and I await them like everybody else. I wouldn't want to preempt that. I know that in terms of the remit that Lord Brackadale had, it was to look at uh, hate crime in the round in Scotland and in effect to see if it, what we have is sufficient for the 21st century for where we currently are. Uh, and included in that was to have a look at the 2012 Act in that context. Um, and that is the task that Lord Bracto has. I, I know that he has engaged in a, a, a wide-ranging consultation and in the invitation uh, to uh, seek uh, submissions to his consultation, he did also seek inter alia uh, views on uh, the potential impacts, consequences of uh, a repeal of the 2012 Act. Uh, and uh, I think the consultation is now closed, so yes. he'll be looking at the responses that he's received across the piece on a whole host of issues, including on that issue. Obviously, uh, Mr Kelly's bill and the progress of that is a matter in the first instance, I don't know, for this committee, I guess, and the Parliament as a whole. Uh, and if the committee uh, felt that they wished to wait or to pause their deliberations pending Lord Brackadale, that would be obviously a matter for, in the first instance, the committee. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I think I'm expanding on that uh, later in the committee, but I just thought it was important in terms of dovetailing with the previous questions. Uh, the other point I wanted to bring up was in... Supplementary from Neil McArthur. Sorry, ben. We're going into private sessions shortly to, to um, consider a report on the civil litigation uh, bill. That was based, obviously, on a report by Sheriff Principal Taylor um, it was published in 2013. Um, so, in awaiting the report from Lord Brackadale, um, it is conceivable that we could be uh, waiting some four or five years before uh, any legislation is brought forward to address the shortcomings that I think, by wide consensus, are uh, accepted uh, in, in this bill, particularly in relation to Section 1. So, does the Minister accept that, um, that while it's interesting that Lord Brackadale is, is undertaking this review, and I think all of us will uh, await the outcomes of that with some interest, um, it would perhaps be uh, naive to assume that any, uh, any legislation flowing from that uh, addressing the shortcomings in this bill uh, is likely to happen uh, any time soon. Well, I, I can't preempt the, the work of Lord Brackadale. It's an independent uh, piece of work, uh, and I, I wouldn't uh, dare to preempt that in any regard, be it uh, in terms of the recommendations, whether it's proposing legislation new or not, whether it's making any other suggestions. I, I can't uh, preempt that, uh, and I think we just have to uh, let Lord Brackadale uh, proceed in the way that he was tasked uh, uh, to do. Obviously, the work that he is doing does uh, dovetail, I think, as Ben McPherson uh, said, with the work uh, that's currently before the committee in regard to this matter, and it would be a matter for the committee uh, to see if it wished to be informed by uh, the work of Lord Brackadale or, or not. Okay, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to now move on to the point that was raised in your opening statement, 
Minister, about the <coughs> evidence that's been received from the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Uh, they have made reference that, in their view, that uh, key provisions in the 2012 Act may fall short of the principles of legal certainty and the requirement of lawfulness under the European Convention on Human Rights. However, the committee has also heard from the Equality and, and Human Rights Commission, uh, Mr Chris Oswald, when he gave evidence orally a, a number of weeks ago, that although the ECHR recognises that freedom of speech and freedom of expression are enormously important and are protected by Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, they need to be balanced against the International Covenant on civil and political rights, which says that states need to have in place laws that counter incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence. I just, on the basis of particularly of the recent submission of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, can the Minister just clarify that you're, you're confident that the 2012 Act has not fallen short of those principles? Okay. Um, the, in terms of the Scottish Human Rights Commission's uh, submission, uh, I think you received it around the weekend. Um, what I would say is that, firstly, when the bill, the original legislation, when the bill was put before Parliament, of course, like any bill, it has to be certifi certified by the presiding officers within competence. Uh, and we have a duty to comply with the Human Rights <coughs> Act under the, the Scotland Act. Um, obviously, then it was passed by Parliament. Now, following its passage by the Parliament, no, uh, the law officers did not seek to raise any action to, uh, to challenge uh, compatibility. Um, since that time, we have seen, as I referred to, I think, uh, a wee while back, at a, a particular appeal case, the case of Donnelly and Walsh versus the Procreative Fiscal, and that was an appeal case of March 2015, with three uh, appeal judges, and the view was taken uh, that actually, uh, in that instant case, it was Article 7, but the Article 7 of the EACHR was not infringed, and the appeal was dismissed. Uh, and I think, um, in terms of the... the paper of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, I mean, they did, uh, were engaged in the discussions around the original legislation. I think it seems to me that their paper is kind of echoing what they said then, but maybe perhaps not taking into account particular developments that have happened since then, uh, including, of course, this uh, appeal case and also uh, the fact that the Lord Advocate uh, issued guidelines. No account has been taken of that as regards issues about certainty of law and so forth. On the, the member's other point, about the evidence from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, I, I noted that uh, and this reference to the International Covenant taking precedence in this regard over the ECHR uh, and that I thought was an interesting uh, 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 submission and one I would imagine that the committee would wish to reflect on when it is deliberating in terms of its uh, report. Thank you for, for clarifying that, Minister. It's, it's very helpful. On the... Um, moving forward somewhat into... Other evidence we've received, referring back to Section 1 of the 2012 Act, it has been argued by some that the Act should be extended to include situations outside of a football context, for example, marches and parades. Um, bearing in mind everything that's been said earlier, that no proposals for amendment have, have been brought forward to, to yourself, and that in order for the current Act to be amended, it, it, it needs to not be repealed, um, with all those caveats, uh, do you think it's a feasible suggestion to potentially, <coughs> potentially include marches and parades? Uh, well, I, I know, uh, having read the, the, the evidence, that obviously issues of certain marches have, uh, have um, caused concern. Um, and the, there are a number of uh, points here. There was actually a, a fairly recent report by Dr. Michael Rosie on uh, marches, parades and static demonstrations, I think was the, the title, uh, and a number of, of uh, issues were put forward. But I, I do recall that he concluded that in terms of the investigation he had carried out, the vast majority of marches uh, and parades uh, of whatever uh, persuasion were carried out in good order and, and peacefully. Now, obviously, the police do have powers under the Public Order Act 1986 to deal with disorder at marches and parades. However, what I would say is, of course, uh, in terms of an open-door approach, if there is significant evidence of problems of disorder at marches and parades, then, of course, the government uh, will be required to look at that. Uh, and if that then uh, means that uh, it possible uh, response to that could be, uh, assuming the Act is still in place, uh, a look at the Act, then that's something we're, we're prepared to do. Obviously, uh, it is, would be too early to, to 
preempt what the result of that deliberation would be. But we would need to see, firstly, that there was evidence of significant, um, a significant problem that needed to be tackled in some way, and then we would need to reflect on what we thought working with others and, and uh, stakeholders would be the best way to, to tackle that. But it's certainly an issue that uh, we uh, keep under uh, uh, advisement and will continue to do so. Of course, we get back to the, 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 the key, one of the key arguments here of, on the part of those who seek to repeal the bill, which is freedom of expression. Now, of course, freedom of expression is always a tricky thing because it's, it's always fine when it's, you're expressing what you want to hear and you don't want to necessarily hear the other uh, view. Uh, but, of course, uh, we uh, live in a society where uh, marches and parades are part of our understanding of freedom of expression, of course. Uh, the people who participate therein are subject to the same rules and norms as everybody else. And if there are significant issues of disorder, then absolutely uh, we would uh, be wishing to look into that. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. If supplementary, Liam Kerr. Very briefly, just, <clears throat> Minister, if I may, the, Dr Rosie's research, she said it, it concluded that the vast majority of these marches was carried out peacefully. Uh, and you went on from that to say that that's a reason not to legislate against it. If we accept then that the vast majority of football matches uh, are carried out peacefully, um, do not exhibit the behaviours complained of, then isn't that a reason not to legislate on them either? Uh, I, I don't know if it's an exact uh, analogy, to be fair, uh, uh, to Mr Kerr. Uh, what we have seen and what we continue to see uh, at football are instances of abusive, uh, offensive, threatening behaviour, uh, chanting, offensive chanting and all the rest of it and we continue to see that regularly. I think the point uh, that was made in the Rosie research was that in, in many instances where he had had a look at the matter there weren't really any issues raised about public disorder. That's not the case sadly in and around football where there are and continue to be issues raised in terms of unacceptable behaviour and as I think I mentioned uh, a while ago in 2016-17 uh, we have seen 377 charges under the Act, an increase of 32% from the previous year. So I think that would suggest that there's still uh, uh, an issue there and that we're not yet ready to let rest on our laurels uh, about uh, conduct at football. On the part of the, absolutely agree with the member in that regard, on the part of a tiny minority, but a tiny minority uh, that can have quite an impact in terms of the messages that we are sending out, particularly to young people in Scotland. Briefly, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, just uh, thanks for being a very brief question. Uh, to me, that marches and parades are subject to um, scrutiny by local authority committees uh, prior to any such march taking place that football games are not. I mean, the, the process for approving uh, marches and parades and static demonstrations is very much driven by local authorities uh, in discussion with the police, uh, and obviously uh, that is there for a matter of them. Uh, as regards this parliament, obviously if, if uh, people come forward indicating there is very significant evidence of uh, uh, disorder of such a nature that action would require to be considered at least, uh, then, uh, then we would consider that. But the member is absolutely right to say that in the first instance... Uh, uh, an application is made to the relevant local authority and then there's a procedure in place as to how that local authority will then make a decision as to whether that march, parade or static demonstration should go ahead. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, <clears throat> during ev evidence to the committee, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities said, anybody who's old enough to remember the Race Relations Act 1975 will realise how much society has changed in that people don't say things now that they would have said in the 1960s, at least not in public. That's partly down to legislation, so I don't think that we can underestimate the effect that legislation has on attitudes. So I wanted to ask, the government has stated that there are contexts where strongly held religious, political or cultural views are acceptable and quite appropriate. I wonder if you could um, sort of outline what those contexts are and it, if, in your views, there's still a place for this in football in 2017? Um, I, I did read, read the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities submission and I did think that it was uh, an interesting um, uh, point that they made, uh, citing the Race Relations Act of 1965, I think it was, um, where they said that, amongst other things, that a very, very strong signal had been sent by that one piece of legislation to society about what was acceptable and what was not acceptable as regards those uh, matters. 
Uh, and uh, going back to the, the, the fundamental principles always come back to this conversation, the issue of freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is, is, is a right, but it is not absolute, and it is tempered by the need to respect the rights of others. Uh, and I, I think that is therefore the, the key element of this part of the, the, the discussion on the, the, the Act uh, and the Members' Bill. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, as I say, um, as to where we should see uh, the, the dividing lines, clear guidance is given by the Lord Advocate's uh, uh, guidelines of, uh, updated guidelines of August 2015, as to where, uh, uh, in all relevant respects, that, uh, that, that, that uh, judgment should be, be made. Uh, and in that regard, of course, police officers make judgments on a daily basis. Uh, about uh, a whole host of things and they use their judgment in accordance with guidelines set down in accordance with training that they have had and that is the same for this legislation as it is for many other parts of the law. Thank you. If I could just briefly follow up with um, given that 69% of offences under this Act occur at football stadiums um, would you say it's, it's a, a fair reflection um, that um, football culture has not been targeted by this legislation if 69% of the offences occur at football stadiums? Well, I, I think that it's fair to say the legislation is to, to do with uh, behaviour in and around uh, football, and that is, is the, the way the legislation uh, was drafted. Of course, uh, this piece of legislation uh, it's not alone in looking at football where you know, there is evidence of significant, uh, of, uh, significant problems over the years. Uh, we have seen legislation in England and Wales, the Football Offences Act 1991, uh, where uh, legislation was introduced to deal with specific problems, uh, including, I think, pitch invasion and, and chanting. And we have seen also both north and south of the border legislation introduced to deal uh, with football in terms of alcohol and issues around uh, alcohol sales and consumption. So uh, I, I think, first of all, we have recognised that there are problems and that we have uh, sought to try to address those, and that is in keeping with other jurisdictions and other kinds of legislation that uh, recognises also uh, problems in this regard. Um, I, it is uh, fair to say, and I, as I said before, that this is a tiny minority of fans that cause problems in this regard, and the vast majority of football fans want to go to the match and enjoy the game, and they want to be able to take their families, and I did read some really quite um, depressing submissions from individuals, grandfathers and so on, who said that they wouldn't take their grandson to a game anymore because uh, they just felt it was inappropriate that their young member of family should be uh, subjected to this kind of uh, behaviour. So I do think that that is very telling and indeed very depressing in uh, 21st century uh, Scotland. So it, it is clear that there is a problem at football. Uh, it is a tiny minority of fans. I think uh, the figure from Police Scotland was there's something like four million uh, turnstile uh, visits to, to uh, football matches, I guess, over the season. Uh, and um, of that four million, so in 1617, for example, you're looking at charges under this particular legislation of 377. So I think that gives you the context, but just because there are 377 charges and 4 million visits at the turnstile. That doesn't mean to say that this is not a problem that is corrosive uh, and is damaging to society. This is a problem that is corrosive, damaging to society and impacts negatively on so many other people, including uh, vulnerable uh, uh, groups. So I think it is uh, therefore appropriate that we recognise that there was an issue to tackle and we sought to do that by way of this legislation amongst other actions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. If I could perhaps at this point ask if, if members and, and the Minister could be as concise as, okay. as possible. It would be very helpful. We're, we're um, but halfway through our questioning with less than half of our time left. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Sabina. Okay, briefly, uh, sticking with previous evidence, Bemis stated that the 2012 Act has had a negligible, negligible effect when it comes to tackling hate crime. And if anything, they suggested it has caused confusion as to what is actually criminalised by the Act. Do you accept that criticism? Uh, no, I read uh, both Bemis' uh, papers. I didn't quite follow the second one as clear as the first one. But no, I, I don't really uh, accept that. I think um, that, as we have seen, uh, for example, uh, in 1617, 377 charges. We have seen in 1516... Uh, uh, a, a, a conviction rate of, I think, around 76%. Uh, and if we compare that in uh, 1516, 
comparable conviction rates so for breach of the peace um, was 74% and common assault was 84%. So I think we see that that fits you know, in a reasonable spot. Uh, so uh, the Act has been effective. Uh, of course, the Act is one uh, element of the work that the government does in this regard. Uh, I think also it was Police Scotland that indicated that improvements in football behaviour in general terms, uh, the Act has been influential but should not be seen in isolation and many other issues come to the fore, including improvements in, in Minister, studio as well. forgive me, can I ask you about that, just given the time? Because you said at the start that uh, we need to eradicate the bile. Uh, do, you, do you believe that the Act has done anything of itself uh, to eradicate the underlying attitudes and beliefs that manifest themselves as this offensive behaviour? Uh, yes, I do, and I think that was recorded in the evidence from Police Scotland, that there's a greater uh, awareness now of these issues. It's much more to the fore. Uh, and indeed, uh, he, I think the, the police officer re referenced an incident, an example, for example, of self-reporting at a particular match. So I, I think, yes, uh, it has had an impact, but I, I wouldn't be uh, uh, but on at the all suggesting belief. that it is uh, the only piece of, of, of uh, work of importance in this regard. It is not. It is not a panacea, as I said in my opening statement, mm -hmm. but it nonetheless is important to give the police uh, and the Crown Office the tools that they need uh, to, to seek to tackle uh, the problems that we face in this regard. Uh, Marie Goujon put it that uh, football-related hate crime has increased by a third on the railways. And uh, I think in response you accepted and noted that women were afraid to go into Glasgow, uh, presumably on a match day. I'm not sure if you qualified it, but I imagine you meant to. Uh, but doesn't that tend to suggest that the Act isn't working? Well, it, it was, I was actually quoting the Scottish Women's Convention. I think you'll find from their evidence that they made that point that actually women are afraid to go into Glasgow, in this instance it was Glasgow on a Saturday, if there's a big match on. Right. Uh, and as a, a Glaswegian uh, female uh, 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 who lived in Glasgow for many years, I, I get that. I, I get it. I got it then and I, I still get it uh, to this day. Uh, but in terms of the, I think the issue that members trying to get at is, you know, people's underlying um, feelings here in terms of whether they have particularly strong feelings that uh, the, the rest of society would find uh, unacceptable in terms of public uh, display. And of course, uh, we need to, to work in a number of ways to tackle underlying um, Forgive feelings me, such that, you know, to pr promote your identity, you have to, to celebrate your identity, you have to hate somebody else's identity, I think was put forward by one of the academics. Um, yes, I, there are a number of strands, but the Act, but the act in, as well, I, sorry, I, I the Act as well on. has a role to play. Yes, uh, yeah. but the, the, the point was, I was interested, I hadn't heard Marie Goujon's statistic, you see, about this, this third rise, and does that not tend to suggest, it, given that the Act's been in, if, the, if there's been a decline in this behaviour, which uh, you would attribute to the Act coming in presumably, and now it's on the rise again, does that not tend to suggest that the Act is either, uh, has either worked and now is no longer working, or that any previous decline is a function of other things going on, as you say, other behaviours by the football clubs, for example? Well, I, as I say, the Act is not panacea in and of itself, and uh, the fact that, uh, sadly, in our society, in many regards, hate crime is increasing, I think is not a, a reason to take our foot off the pedal. I think it rather is a reason uh, to reflect very carefully on what we have as tools available, in this case, to the police and to the, the Crown Office and Procreative Fiscal Service, to help to tackle uh, problems where they arise in terms of of offensive behaviour, uh, hateful and prejudicial behaviour that actually is uh, uh, criminal, it's against uh, the law, the norms of our society. And I think, therefore, that the Act plays a role in that regard. Obviously, uh, as has been said already, repealing the Act without a viable alternative being in place has uh, been uh, said to risk uh, uh, very serious consequences in terms of the, the wrong signal uh, being sent, the wrong message. And I think that would be a very important point to bear in mind in terms of what the member has just uh, rightly said about increases in hate crime generally in terms of certain types of hate crime. So I think it's a, 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 it's a good reason to reflect very carefully on actions taken and not to act uh, too hastily and maybe regret at leisure. Uh, one final question for me. Uh, you stated in your opening remarks that the offensive behaviours displayed by football fans are not replicated in any other sport, uh, which begs the question, if someone at a rugby match made a homophobic or a racist comment which was audible to others, uh, which was offensive and 
perhaps led to a public disorder. Presumably, they would be charged with an offence. If so, which offence? Well, that would be a matter um, for the uh, for the, the Crown Office uh, in the end of the day. But, I mean, I would imagine in, in those circumstances that one potential route would be breach of the peace, Section 38 of the uh, Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, uh, it for be example. One, would it? It, Pardon me? They, they wouldn't be charged under this legislation. Uh, no, of course, it would, because it would not be taking in and around football. I mean, that is part of the, this legislation. Uh, and I think what has been uh, uh, seen uh, in uh, a number of submissions made is that actually this problem doesn't exist uh, in, in any particular degree in any other sport. I, I have seen, did, I have seen submissions other... about, you know, uh, uh, an offensive behaviour at Bowls Act. Now, I'm not aware that uh, there is a huge incidence of disorder at bowling clubs, the length and breadth of Scotland, uh, where we have racist and religious and homophobic slurs and bigotry and bile. So I think we have to accept where the evidence leads us. The evidence leads us to the place where we see that there is a problem in and around football. It is a minority of fans, the majority of fans, the vast majority of fans do not want to engage in this behaviour. But not recognising that there is a problem, I don't t think, takes us uh, very far uh, in a debate on how best to, to tackle uh, uh, the issue. OK, moving on. Um, Liam MacArthur. Following up on that, does that not, the, the, the issue that Liam Kerr just highlighted, not um, point to a, a fundamental problem in that if the behaviour is offensive and, and something that we would, um, uh, we would wish to, to see eradicated, it didn't really matter um, where it happens, and that talking of this legislation uh, in uh, in the context of, of a piece with the Race Relations Act is to misrepresent the Race Relations Act, uh, which was targeting behaviour, racist behaviour, uh, and acts uh, across the piece, irrespective of where they uh, they, they took place. Uh, whereas this has is solely focused on behaviour in and around um, football, irrespective of whether it, it may be more prevalent there uh, or not, it, it actually uh, it sends out a message that that behaviour in other contexts either is, um, is not deemed to be important enough to tackle or can be tackled through other means, which is, um, is certainly the case that's been made by many, um, that this, this behaviour is already covered in the existing legislation prior to the 2012 Act. Um what I would say, a couple of points, um, if I may. Uh, so the, the, the member um, referred to a particular piece of legislation and, you know, that that applied, you know, ergo omnes and this doesn't. Um, of course, you know, there has been, I think I mentioned in my opening statement, for example, the Emergency Workers Act, which was introduced in 2005. Uh, and that was recognising a specific problem. Now, there is an overlap in terms of the offences there. They can be charged. I'm looking to see some of the Scottish Legal Department nodding. They can be charged under other uh, libels. But nonetheless, it was felt important to recognise that there was a specific problem and to, to deal with that by way of a particular piece of legislation for emergency uh, workers. Uh, in terms of the general issue the member raises, as I've said, this legislation provides an extra tool. It's a, an extra... Uh, uh, a tool for uh, the, the police and for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. I think you've had very detailed evidence uh, from the Crown Office uh, explaining exactly uh, why um, the position of the existing legislation uh, could, of course, be reverted to, but there would be limitations, therefore, going forward uh, in what kind of behaviours uh, could be uh, uh, dealt with, and that was dealt with very clearly by the Crown Office in their or oral evidence to the committee, so I won't repeat it all uh, again. So th there was a very clear um, explanation given as to where we would uh, fall short in terms of cover uh, that we currently have if the Act is repealed we, without a viable alternative. If we deprecate, I'll come on to that in a second, but if we deprecate the behaviour and want to see it eradicated, uh, and we want to send out a strong message to that effect, then why on earth are we distinguishing between offensive behaviour in one context and offensive behaviour in another context? Uh, well, I, I think we, we go back to first principles and, and the debate we've been having all morning, which was, was that there was a recognition that there was a particular problem in and around football, a particular problem that wasn't replicated at rugby, wasn't replicated at tennis, wasn't replicated at bowl, bowling clubs, the length and breadth of Scotland. There was a particular... but, is replicate, but is replicated in society at large? I mean, that, that, in the sense, what we're, what we're seeing is a, a reflection of football 
of something that is still all too prevalent, I think all of us would agree, within society in general. Now, there may be flashpoints at football, but if you're going to deprecate the behaviour, um, it, surely it should make no difference where that behaviour happens. Well, I, I, I would go back to uh, the, the comment I made a while ago about um, the, uh, Dr Duncan Morrow's uh, approach in terms of the advisory group on tackling sectarianism, where they recognised that football provides a permissive environment where people may act in a way that they wouldn't actually act uh, in, in other uh, 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 environments, but in the football environment, it's this permissive environment that seems to uh, um, engender amongst a minority of people the idea that you can act with impunity and behave in behaviour that would not be acceptable uh, 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 in society at large. And that is the... Uh, the, the, that is recognising the fundamental crux of the issue here about why it is legislation designed to deal with issues in and around football in the way that uh, that has been recognised in England as far as the uh, English but, legislation but, of 1991 and indeed uh, uh, approaches on both sides of the border about alcohol uh, at football. There is recognition that there are particular issues to be addressed and recognising too, as I've said from the outset, that legislation by itself is not a panacea but recognising, too, that uh, legislation is a tool and it has a role uh, but, to play. But that would suggest that you would expect uh, more of the convictions and more of the charges to be brought in relation to incidents in and around football. But again, should not um, uh, deter us from, from cracking down on uh, and, and, and tackling this behaviour wherever uh, it occurs. I mean, on the, the issue of Section 1, uh, which you, you, you touched on, and the evidence from the Crown Office and Pocket Fiscal um, Service, um, around repeal of the, the 2012 Act would leave gaps in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the law for tackling these offences. We also had evidence um, that there was no uh, real uh, gap um, that would be left by the, um, the, the removal of Section 1. So can you perhaps elaborate what specifically the, the, the gap would be should the bill be uh, repealed, particularly in relation to Section 1? Okay, um, I, I think I, I would point uh, to the uh, evidence that was given by the, the Crown uh, uh, Office representative. I thought it was a very clear uh, statement of the position. So, firstly, taking but it was contradicted by uh, other legal representatives. We had well, he, who a person whether it was a you know is applying the law day and daily in the Crown Office. So, I, I felt that as a person who therefore has to work with the Act to determine what charges can be liable or not in particular circumstances, I thought it was a a reasonable source to go to to get a, a clear picture of where exactly things are in the Crown Office as we speak. So as far as Section 1 is concerned, uh, it was said that firstly, uh, the uh, provisions concerning extraterritorial, extraterritorial application of the Act uh, are not present in, uh, in what was existing legislation prior to the entry into force of the Act. Uh, secondly, there are limitations uh, as regards um, the different evidential tests, and we've dealt with the, the, the issue of the incitement uh, to public disorder in terms of breach of the peace in Section 38 of the 2010 Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act. Uh, that is a, a, f a fear and alarm uh, a, a test, if you like. So there's a different evidential uh, test. Uh, and then in terms of Section 6, uh, there is um, an issue about extraterritorial application that is not present in other legislation. There's an issue about differential sentencing uh, powers uh, in terms of existing legislation, i.e. legislation before the entry into force of the 2012 Act. Um, the issue is that the penalties can be pursued on a summary basis, whereas under the uh, 2012 Act, they can be pursued on a solemn basis, and I think that's a very important extra tool that the... Uh, uh, Crown Office uh, should have. Um, also, um, the Lord Advocate's guidelines, uh, sorry, the Crown Office letter to, um, the, to Mr Kelly in his uh, consultation on his bill made it quite clear that um, there could be behaviour that could be prosecuted under Section 1 which would not be capable or securely capable of being prosecuted um, under uh, existing uh, legislation and I think it was the former uh, Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland when he was before the Justice Committee but perhaps at a previous session of the Justice Committee who explained that a benefit of the Act is that you don't then have to shoehorn cases into existing legislation so I think uh, that is a reflection of, of where matters stand in terms of the Crown Office of, of Scotland and an independent uh, Office of Government. I think it explains very well uh, what the deficiencies are in the existing legislation and it shows quite clearly 
why the 2012 Act gives this additional uh, power, additional uh, tool uh, to have at the disposal of those seeking to uh, apply the laws of, of the country. Finally, briefly, and, and, and talking of deficiencies of legislation, obviously we've heard um, a, a considerable amount of evidence about the deficiencies of this uh, 2012 Act, particularly in relation to Section 1. Uh, do you regret, or does the government regret, not bringing forward uh, its own proposals for amendment to address those deficiencies uh, prior to the publication of the repeal bill? Well, we, we don't believe that the, the act should be repealed. So but that's, that, no, but first that's a first starting point. That's a, that's, Sorry. A, that's, a, that's a different point. You can argue whether or not it's easy to address the issues that we all agree are there uh, and that Lord Brackadale will in, in part be looking uh, to address with, with, with uh, his own recommendations in due course. Debatable whether or not it's easier to do that on the basis of a deficient uh, legislation being in, pa in place that needs to be amended or, or clearing the decks of that uh, legislation uh, and, and putting in place a, a firmer and more um, well-balanced uh, structure. But um, what I'm asking is whether or not, given the evidence the committee has heard, uh, does the government regret not having brought forward its own proposals uh, for reform of the 2012 Act? Um, prior to the publication of the repeal bill James Kelly's brought okay. forward? Uh, well, I, I, as I mentioned in my response to, to Claire Baker uh, a while back, um, I, I don't necessarily accept the, 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 the kind of uh, list of, of uh, complaints about the Act in some of the, the submissions. Um, I, I have also said uh, to the convener on a number of occasions this morning that, of course, uh, everything in life, in my experience, can be improved, including legislation. I don't accept the act is deficient, but can legislation be improved? Legislation can always uh, uh, be improved. I've also said that uh, my door has always been open to people coming to make con uh, constructive uh, suggestions that are evidence-based. Uh, not one person has has um, sought to come to speak to me. So uh, uh, we are where we are. Uh, and what I would say is uh, that, of course, uh, I absolutely uh, note the evidence of uh, a whole host of people. But by the same token, it is important as well to note that there is evidence uh, uh, whereby people take very different views uh, as well. And I think, uh, obviously, that is something the committee will have to reflect on in its deliberations. If your door is open and you can't get inside the head of those who've been raising concerns, is it a surprise uh, that they haven't actually taken up that offer? To uh, well, no, I, I don't think that's really a, a very constructive comment, if I may say so. My door is always open. I've said that uh, from the outset, and nobody has come to make any constructive suggestion uh, at all. What I said at the beginning was, I... I don't, you know, the, the, some of the instances, as I've mentioned, which were uh, stepped forth in various of the, particularly the individual uh, submissions about the fact that, uh, you know, the, all fans are being criminalised unduly and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I don't accept that as a matter of fact that the evidence shows that that is the case. I do not believe that. Therefore, I find it difficult in that regard to get into the mind of somebody that is saying that this is criminalising all football fans when the evidence patently shows that that's not the case. So in that regard, uh, I, I do uh, struggle to understand why it is that they, they hold that view when the evidence shows the contrary. But uh, by the same token, I do note that uh, obviously people have very strong views uh, and they have strong views on both sides. And obviously the committee will want to reflect on that in its further deliberations. First then. Minister, I want to touch on the threatening communications aspect of the, the, the current Act and, and, and Section 6 in particular, which the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities has said, uh, has remarked on that uh, we would deplore the message that repeal of Section 6 would inevitably send both to perpetrators and victims of threatening communications, as well as the fact that it would be more difficult for such offences to be prosecuted. Uh, you spoke in your opening remarks about the extraterritorial element to Section 6 and indeed evidence from the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service it spoke of its benefits as well. So uh, in, 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 in summary, could the Minister elaborate on why the repeal of Section 6 would in the, the government's evidence be deeply problematic? Well, I believe that Section 6 has provided some uh, clarity. So it has introduced for the, the first time in, into Scots law a specific offence of uh, threatening communications to stir up uh, religious hatred. 
uh, that was present uh, down south. That wasn't a specific offence in Scotland. So that has given, uh, again, uh, uh, the Crown Office uh, has given them a, a, a clear uh, tool available where the circumstances of, of an instant case uh, 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 are, are relevant. Uh, and of course, as I've already mentioned, um, the Act provides extraterritorial application, which uh, has uh, proven to be uh, useful in, in a recent case. I don't know if the if Craig has got that to hand, I don't have that case well, to hand. The recent case uh, involved extraterritoriality as such, um, but there is an extraterritorial aspect to Section 6, which is that people beyond Scotland sending messages which are intended to be read mm -hmm. by a Scottish audience or by a person in Scotland are encompassed by the, the, the reach of the Act, which would be lost, obviously, on repeal. I should perhaps just say, just to go back to the, the Mr Kerr's previous point, for the sake of completeness, uh, the committee might find it useful. We were talking about gaps. I think it's accepted by everyone who's given evidence, and certainly it would be my view, there is no specific uh, crime of incitement to religious hatred in Scotland, absent the provision in Section 6 of the Act, and that, I suspect, might be a relevant gap to, for the committee to consider going forward. Thank you. And, uh, th that's helpful. And, and just to, to, to elaborate further on it with regard to Section 6, we've heard a uh, different con uh, comment on it, for example, from uh, Dr Webster that uh, has asserted that Section 6 fails to distinguish uh, hatred from abuse, uh, thereby conflating the two and criminalising both. And also we heard comment from written evidence from Police Scotland that Section 6 in, is narrow in scope and um, that's made it challenging in terms of wide use by, by the police. So I wondered if, if the Minister could, could comment on, on those two concerns that have been raised with regard to, to Section 6. Um, firstly, on Dr Webster's uh, submission, I, I, I didn't quite, I, I don't agree with his conclusion uh, in that regard. Um, secondly, on the issue of the uh, Police Scotland's uh, the representative in the oral evidence that uh, the, the scope may be narrow in their view. Um, I would be, as again, my door is open, I'm happy to discuss uh, matters with Police Scotland on that particular point. We hold regular discussions about many issues, including about the Act, and uh, if there are issues that they wish to bring to my attention, then I'm happy to, to look at that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, uh, Maurice Curry. Minister, could you comment on the suggestion that the 2012 Act has made tackling sectarianism in the context of football matches uh, much more difficult? Um, I don't believe that's the case. I'm not quite sure what's um, triggering the members. What was it? Is it, ma is it uh, meaning that the, uh, the, the policeman who is dealing with the issue of the, you know, taking the law and uh, dealing with it is making it more difficult to understand, he or she, to understand... Um, where he or she can bring a charge? Uh, well, I, I think, as I've said, in terms of the Lord Advocate's guidelines, it's very clear uh, what uh, the, the, the circumstances will be. And, in, and, of course, in the guidelines, there is a requirement to exercise common sense to reflect football rivalry, football fan rivalry, and to reflect proportionality. And, of course, the police have been trained uh, in their approach to various pieces of legislation, including with regard to the 2012 Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I think it's important to remember that the Act itself makes no provision for policing at all. Policing is an operational matter, mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, for uh, uh, Police uh, Scotland. Uh, and uh, the, I think it was the, the, in the police evidence they suggested that actually the in terms of the number of cases uh, brought before the Crown Office, there was something like an 89%, 85% um, progression of that case. Uh, and so they felt that they were uh, understanding very well uh, 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 the, the legislation in that so many cases were being uh, proceeded with. Of course, I think it's also fair, just in conclusion, to say that also reading the police evidence, uh, they, they have uh, expressed the view that actually... Um, they don't see necessarily that much would change in terms of policing if, if the Act were to be uh, repealed. It would be business uh, as usual. Can I add another one? Uh, uh, do, do you feel that the, there's, there's a sort of um, feeling, there's a groups of fans who feel that their, their side's been unfairly targeted? Would you feel that's a pretty reasonable um, representation of the facts? No, I, I don't think the evidence bears that out. I think, as I said already, uh, uh, so the, the example was given, I think, again, by Police Scotland that of the 42 professional uh, clubs in Scotland, 
uh, charges have involved fans coming from about 24 of those clubs and therefore uh, it was indicative of the fact that this is not a piece of legislation that is simply applied to one particular kind of football fan but this is applied erga omnes uh, and it is uh, applied with respect to the behaviour uh, uh, not the, 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 the team that the particular fan supports it is the behaviour of the individual concerned that attracts the attention of, of the act. Right. In relation to sectarianism, um, it's not defined in Scots law, as you probably realise as a lawyer yourself, Minister. Um, will it ever be possible to define sectarianism in, in a, sectarianism in a Scottish context? Well, that's quite important in relation to this subject. Well, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, certainly, at the origin of the, this legislation was that it, shouldn't be, uh, it should be wider than simply looking at sectarianism, mm -hmm. but I, I think... It is interesting to note that in the interim period of time, Dr Morrow's advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland it did come up with a, a definition of sectarianism, and I think there has been some uh, work with uh, grassroots organisations to get some feedback on what people feel about that definition. So uh, we are again happy to, to reflect on uh, where we are uh, with that and uh, indeed uh, to reflect on... on whether it would be advisable in all circumstances to seek to proceed with a definition uh, of, uh, of sectarianism. Bearing in mind, again, as what I said earlier, and the member will know himself, that obviously if you come up with a particular definition in law, you, you've got to be careful that you're not uh, being unduly uh, restrictive in, in terms of how you want to, to phrase that. But I think it's certainly interesting that the advisory committee have done this piece of work in that regard, and it would be a timely moment to have a look at, at that. Thank you, Minister. Thank okay. you, yeah. That concludes the <coughs> committee's questioning. I now um, ask James Kelly to um, ask any questions that he'd like to on the bill. Okay, thank you, convener. Morning, Minister. Um, during the course of the session this morning, you've made a number of comments about the uh, behaviour of football fans, the atmosphere around football stadiums, and I wondered what informed your view on that. Uh, how many football matches have you attended over the years? Okay, uh, my last football match was uh, the, I think it was the first uh, Rangers Celtic uh, game after uh, recent developments affecting Rangers Football Club. And it was last um, September, would it have been September 2016? I attended that game, and that game took place at Celtic Park. Uh, so, have you ever actually paid to enter a football match? Uh, well, I was there as minister. I've been quite happy to pay, but I was there as minister. I think I was probably there as uh, at least uh, tolerated by Celtic uh, Football Club themselves because I did visit uh, the, the command centre and all the rest of it. But uh, I, I, if asked to pay now, I'm quite happy to do that, Mr Kelly. Yeah, but from what you're saying, I don't think you've actually paid to enter. Oh, football. no, I have. I've been over the past, uh, but I tend to... It's a national game that I would perhaps find more interesting. So, yes, I have been to football and I have paid, but uh, in terms of the... Uh, recent times, the match in September 2016 was the most recent match I have been to. But your experience of club football is somewhat limited. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a, a, a hugely experienced club football person, no. And I've never I pretended to, to, to be so, Mr Kelly. OK, so in that case, can you understand the, the criticisms that are made towards yourself and your government? And they feel that... Uh, the view that you've formed is one that you've formed from your ministerial office and it's not actually informed from being in the football stadium and uh, sharing the experiences of football supporters. Well, it, it, my, my job as minister is to, is to uh, work with uh, <coughs> all relevant uh, stakeholders and others, is to uh, read the evidence, is to listen, is to work hard and to reflect on evidence before me and to reach conclusions. And the evidence before me, for example, on the issue of uh, the claim uh, that this act has criminalised football fans, this act uh, has uh, dealt with uh, those cases where the behaviour itself has attracted, uh, has attracted the attention, irrespective of club, of football strip, uh, of affiliation, of, of any other... Uh, issue. It is behaviour that has attracted the attention uh, of, of the Act uh, and that is the evidence that is before me and that is the evidence indeed that has been given to this committee uh, by, for example, on that issue uh, at Police Scotland. Uh, I wonder if you can help me on another issue. Um, if someone uh, goes to a religious venue, say goes outside a Church of Scotland venue, a Catholic church or a mosque, 
and behaves in a, a hateful manner towards people who are entering that venue, um, how are they dealt with in the courts? Uh, well, each case would depend on its own individual facts and circumstances, so it would depend on what the behaviour was and, and all the rest of it. It would be really very difficult to, to make a general sweeping statement about how... It would depend. Each case depends. It's not... It, there's not a kind of template. There's, you know, the individual behaviour that then attracts uh, attention depending on what the behaviour is in each fact and circumstance. But I don't know if, if uh, I could uh, try to assist uh, Mr Kelly. I think the point really that the Minister is making is, is the, the correct answer, which is the facts and circumstances, the context are everything in terms of determining whether a crime has been committed or not. So to take your example just at its highest, if the person run, runs into the church brandishing a machine gun and firing, that would present one set of charges. If they run into the church and physically assault somebody by punching them, that's a different set of charges. If they try to incite religious hatred, that's potentially a different set of charges. So fact and circumstance specific is very, very important in determining. It's not possible to give a set answer to something without knowing the specifics. Well, right, let's just be a bit more specific then. If somebody uh, stands outside a religious venue and incites religious hatred, you know, abuses people who are entering that religious venue, uh, what, uh, how would they be prosecuted through the courts? Well, for example, if it was threatening communications, it might potentially be under Section 6 of this Act, um, if, if they were looking to stir up religious hatred uh, th through issu issuing uh, unrecorded speech, for example, a banner or, or leaflets or whatever uh, that were threatening uh, in that sense. It could alternatively breach with the peace. It could be uh, under the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act. Um, there are a range of different potential options. It really matters what the specifics are, what the person is saying or doing, who else is there at the time. So if someone then uh, exhibits the same behaviour at a football stadium, clearly that's unacceptable and has to, has to be prosecuted through the courts. And uh, in your case, uh, it would be it would be used, it would be brought forward using this uh, legislation, the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. Why, why do we need, you know, two sets of laws? You know, why do we need a particular set of laws where someone exhibits religious hatred in the street or outside <coughs> a religious venue and a different set of laws for a football ground? Okay, uh, well, I, I, the, the idea of laws overlapping is, is not unique to the area of football. Uh, I gave the example of the Emergency <coughs> Workers Act of 2005, Emergency Workers Scotland Act of 2005, where uh, uh, other laws are there, but it was felt nonetheless that there was a very specific problem that needed to be addressed, and the Emergency Workers uh, Scotland Act uh, was duly passed by this uh, Parliament. So an overlap of, of laws is not a, a new thing. Uh, and in terms of the why the act, um, we, I think, have had a good uh, get-go about why the act this morning. The act was there because uh, there was deemed to be a particular problem in and around football uh, that needed to be uh, uh, addressed. And, of course, whilst I have already said that legislation in and of itself is not a panacea, it is not the only strand available to seek to improve uh, matters. Nonetheless, uh, it was felt that legislation was also uh, a necessary response uh, to uh, 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 behaviour that really uh, was uh, unacceptable to the vast majority of football fans and the vast majority of people in society. So, and you've made a couple of references, <coughs> Minister, to the Emergency Workers Act. And I was on the committee when we, we passed that act. It was a very short act, it was a very problematic act. You know, for example, if someone disappeared through a door and they were no longer in an emergency environment and the same attack um, happened, it wasn't necessarily covered by the act. So um, in the absence of post-legislative scrutiny, I think it's maybe helpful to, to make that, that point um, uh, to, to just balance um, how effective that, that, that's been. OK, but it's, it's on the statute book. Nobody's, nobody's coming forward with a bill to repeal it, so mm. it's still there and still can be used. You, you've spoken a lot about the, the message and the signals that are sent. Surely having one effective piece of legislation that makes it clear on issues, for example, like religious hatred, that such behaviours are unacceptable in the football ground, in the street or outside religious venues is a much stronger message than uh, multiple sets of legislation? Um, I, I, 
well, I mean, Lord Brackendale is looking inter alia at uh, issues of consolidation. That was part of the, the remit, so that is a, a fair point in that uh, uh, regard. Um, but in terms of uh, whether um, this behaviour is to be tackled, uh, the, the legislation, as I say, provides this tool uh, in terms of both Section 1 and in section, terms of Section 6, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the limitations of the existing legislation, it does provide a tool, and I have dealt with that, I think, at quite some length in response to, in particular, Mr MacArthur. Uh, uh, so it allows this behaviour to be uh, prosecuted. Uh, and I, I think we have heard uh, that, certainly as far as uh, Police Scotland is concerned, it will be uh, business as usual in terms of policing uh, football matches, uh, even in the event that this uh, bill is, is repealed. Okay, uh, if I can look at another issue, um, you'll be aware that in August 2016, uh, a Champions League qualifier match, the Celtic support uh, took part in a, a display uh, in support of Palestine, and that was then supported uh, by motions in this Parliament table by James Dorn and your colleague, and Ross Greer. The police took the view at the time that the, the demonstration wasn't in breach of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. Have you got a view on that? Um, well, I, 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 individual uh, instances are matters for, in the first instance, the police to act in accordance with uh, the, the law, in accordance with their training, having a cognizance of the Lord Advocate's guidelines, and then for the Crown Office to uh, take what the police have have uh, passed on to them and, and, and consider that. So it's difficult to, absent any other facts and circumstances, to, to come out with any particular conclusion. As has been mentioned, uh, the importance of the law is that it deals with the facts and circumstances of each case, and all of that is relevant before arriving at a conclusion. Uh, and otherwise, you would have a, a, a very dangerous situation in society where you didn't look at each individual fact and circumstances, but rather made some sort of blanket um, had some sort of blanket uh, approach. But you accept the view that the police took on that occasion? I, I don't have all the facts and circumstances before me, Mr Kelly, so I, I, I just don't... I, I would need to know all the circumstances well, of the case. Of public, it's a matter of public Yes, record, but I don't Minister. have all the circumstances of the case as to what attendant behaviour there may not have been around that banner and so forth. I, 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 if the member wishes to give me chapter and verse on that, then that's, that's, no, that's it's, fine. It's a matter of public record that the police concluded that you know, there, were no, there were no charges relevant under that. So you can understand the, the confusion people have in that that was clearly a political display. When people uh, look at other political displays that take place at football matches which are captured under the Act, um, for example, a recent Rangers Partick Thistle game, uh, someone at the height of the Catalan crisis, someone brandishing a Catalan flag was ejected from, from the game. Um, surely you see the, the inconsistencies that there are here, Minister? Uh, well, as I say, each case has to rest on its facts and circumstances. I think if the member were to look in, in detail at the Lord Advocate's guidelines updated from August 2015, he would find some helpful information as to what, uh, what benchmarks are used to, to help uh, uh, the police and the Crown Office in, in their approach to this matter. And as I say, facts and circumstances are really important. You have to look at the attendant circumstances of any particular uh, 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 behaviour. And of course, uh, in terms of... Uh, banners and flags and chants uh, there are and songs there are particular provisions of the Lord Advocate guidelines uh, uh, which deals expressly with those matters uh, which I'm happy to read out but I, I think the convener is not wanting me to we really have to do, do that so this, this uh, but I'm sure the member is well aware of, of the guidelines in that regard. Well can, can you perhaps understand why people think that this that reinforces the point made by the Scottish Human Rights uh, Commission in relation to legal certainty, when if a lot of people, and you're not being clear about it here, Minister, if people aren't clear uh, what is or is not a criminal act under the law, how can there be legal certainty? Well, I, I think on the issue of the, the Scottish Human Rights um, Commission's um, uh, submission, uh, I have already uh, responded to that, and I would cite, again, the case of Donnelly and Walsh versus Hockley to Fisco, <coughs> which went to the appeal court in March of 2015, three appeal judges ruled that uh, Article 7 
of the ECHR was not engaged on the, the issue of, uh, of legal certainty, if you like, of the certainty of the law. So that's a ruling from Scotland's uh, appeal court, and I'm sure that the, the member would uh, uh, reflect that that would have some uh, validity in the context of this uh, debate. Final point, uh, convener. Um, is it right, Minister, that you're a member of the Law Society? I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Yeah. And you would, you would give weight to the views of the Law Society then? Uh, I, I would listen as Minister to the views of the Law Society. Uh, I am a member uh, and I have declared that interest on many occasions. I better just do it again quickly. I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I hold a current practising certificate, but I'm not currently practising. So in terms of the Law Society submission uh, in relation to this bill, uh, they said, and I quote directly, in 2015-16, 287 charges were brought under the Section 1 of the 2012 Act. We are of the view that all of them could have been prosecuted under pre-existing legislation um, or at criminal law. You know, surely that is, a, you know, that is, that is a, a credible opinion coming from the Law Society who have looked at this uh, in detail. And surely that's something you must give some weight to. Oh, well, I, I listen to the Law Society as I listen to every other person that makes a submission, individual, uh, named, anonymous, uh, organisation or anybody else. Uh, and what I would say, as I've said already, is that I think that the, the issue of where um, the Act gives this extra tool was very, very clearly set forth by the Crown Office in their evidence, their oral evidence session before the committee where they explained that as far as Section 1 was concerned, under the, the pre-existing uh, laws available, extraterritorial application is not there. Uh, in terms of Section 1, the, there's a different evidential test, so that provides limitations where you to repeal uh, the Act without a viable alternative being in place. And on Section 6, we have heard that um, the extraterritorial uh, effect uh, is not uh, present under pre-existing legislation that there are differences in sentencing opportunities. One is summary, uh, that's the pre-existing approach, and one is solemn, which is the legislation. And of course, the legislation introduces into Scots law for the first time a statutory provision criminalising threats made with the intention of stirring up religious hatred. So if you were to repeal the Act without a viable alternative, you would take all that away and it wouldn't therefore be there and it wouldn't be available to the uh, police and to the, particularly the Crown Office uh, to, to proceed to deal with behaviours that, that fell within those circumstances. So that is the, the position uh, as clearly uh, enunciated by the Crown Office before uh, this committee. Just in terms of Section 6, do you accept the police view that the, the legal threshold is too high in, in terms of Section 6 and therefore uh, it's not effective and, and the evidence shows that in terms of a small number of prosecutions and therefore the Communications Act has, has to be used. Well, the, 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 the position is, with any statute, that I don't think you decide whether a statute is useful or not, depending upon how many uh, recourses are made to it. Uh, there are many laws out there for different reasons passed uh, by this Parliament or elsewhere, uh, and I don't think there's a yearly sort of swoop to see how many charges have been made, and therefore to say that we have to disregard certain statutes and repeal them just because in that in particular year there, wasn't, uh, there weren't charges uh, brought uh, uh, there under. But it is clear uh, that... Uh, each case, again, falls within its own facts and circumstances, and that there will be circumstances where Section 6 is the appropriate route, and there will be circumstances uh, where it won't, and each case is determined by its facts and circumstances, and that is entirely uh, the right approach of any uh, civilised uh, legal system. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. That concludes our question. Can I thank the Minister and the officials for attending? Uh, we now move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 12th December, when we will continue our consideration of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Repeal Bill. And we will also complete Stage 2 consideration of the Domestic Abuse Bill. <laughs> I suspend now to allow the public gallery to clear. <laughs>